Kia ora koutou katau. Welcome uh, Territory 3 community. I'm uh, delighted to be bringing you this webinar live uh, from Wellington, New Zealand and Bondi, uh, Bondi Beach, I think, in Australia. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Roger Sharp, founder of Northridge Partners and um, a bunch of other ventures, which we're going to hear about um, and hear about Northridge as well. And uh, Roger, welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, I'm particularly okay. excited about this because you've been uh, so instrumental behind so many different uh, ventures and stuff over the last sort of 10 to 20 years as this tech innovation ecosystem has built out, not just in New Zealand and Australia, but in Asia and the States as well. So really looking forward to this, um, to the community folks, standard webinar um, process here. We've got a chat function, which is really just mainly for you to talk amongst yourselves or sort of put some, uh, some, some comments around how the conversation's flowing. And then if you do have a specific question, uh, we'd love you to put that in the Q&A uh, functionality. That way I can make sure we get some question and answer time and we answer anything that, that sits in there. So um, on that, uh, Roger, the floor is yours just to, um, to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you've been up to. Oh, very good. Well, kia ora, John. Hi, everyone. And uh, thanks for having me along today. Um, it's definitely g'day from Bombo. We caught, I think, the first or second plane out. It was actually quite hard escaping from New Zealand at the moment, I must say. And um, so, look, a little background on myself. Um, you know, I've, I've been building, financing, and advising growth companies and tech companies uh, since I left uni. Um, got my first job in tech in San Francisco in the very early 80s. Built and sold my first software company for DataCorp, which I set up with my, my wife, Christine, uh, a very long suffering wife. Uh, we sold that in early 87 um, to what is now Vida Advantage. So it's a credit database of every, just about every person in uh, Aotearoa. Uh, and after that, I became an investment banker. So in the process of building data, I uh, bought a couple of companies, merged them together to get bigger. And thought, hmm, I would really like to understand how to finance that software company or a tech company. And how to buy and aggregate. So I joined, um, I, I worked for two investment banks over 15 years, ended up as global head of technology for AB Amro Bank, based in the UK, ran Wall Street for them, ran Asia for them, bought and sold banks, financed uh, tech companies, just about everything you, you can imagine in a really great journey. About 20 years ago, I moved uh, to Australia, to Sydney, uh, immediately bought a block of land in Queenstown that we call home and have really lived between Singapore, Sydney and Queenstown ever since. Um, during that period, I helped build and sell a number of tech companies. Um, you very kindly referred to me being, I, know, I can't recall what the word was, but I think that the really important thing is it's, uh, I've always been in a team that's done it. And it's the power, to me, it's the power of the team that you know, enables you to deliver. I've had my shares of uh, really good deals and the odd really bad deal, and I think it's not authentic to only talk about the good shit you've done. So I'll talk about the bad shit as well, um, just to be authentic. Um, today, I chair a couple of big companies, Iris, which is a global financial software business out of Sydney. It's an ASX 200 company, market cap about two and a half billion. I chair Webjet, which is a global online travel company. At home in NZ, I chair Lotto, which most people don't realise is one of the biggest online companies in New Zealand, um, and uh, work in my firm, Northwood Partners, and in, I think the largest shareholder in Geo, the whole SaaS business we've been building. So that is a bit of a long intro. Oh, no, that's cool. I have to ask the question. Um, uh, you know, Lotto, is that a diversification strategy, or how, how did you end up there? Actually, during the pandemic, when the Treasury rang up and said, would you like to uh, share a lotto? It did seem quite appealing because everything else I was involved in was in shit street. Um, you know, Webjet was uh, was going through its share of problems. But when I looked at lotto, I, you know, I think, John, you get, you get to a certain age, you want to give back to the community, obviously. And, you know, we made $374 million of profit at Lotto to 32 this year. That's $100 million more than last year. We gave it all to the community, 
So the films you see produced, the sports you see, the, the kids in wheelchair lifters, the, the boats you see the Coast Guard, that's all funded by Lotto. And their unique challenge was they were almost about 80% offline in retail. When COVID came, the retail got closed. It was quite an emergency, so because suddenly they're 100 percent online. That's eased back a little bit, but if you think about the massive transformation challenge for a business like Lotto, it turns over a billion and a half dollars to suddenly you know go 100 percent online. To me, that was a challenge uh, worth facing. And now we do about 650 million online, which is a pretty decent e-commerce business. So that's the appeal. I uh, know that's very cool, and um, and there was a purpose to that as well that we'll come to later later on around some changes around ESG. But um, well, let's rip into the pithy stuff because um, we've got a great audience of founders uh, looking. I would imagine for a lot of insights as they look to grow their businesses, obviously, but probably more specifically around the you know the big investment uh, question and challenge that uh, we've all had as founders so I, I'm going to rip into it I'm going to I'm going to give you an option question here because we said we'd talk about best deals and we said we'd talk about worst and I think uh, the opportunity is yours to deal with one of the two first uh, in terms of order. Uh, well I'll go for worst first because then people will remember the best which will come second how's that? Excellent. So um, uh, the backdrop here is that when I set up Northridge Partners with uh, Pete Hind, my partner in Sydney, in, in about 19 years ago, uh, there was no real venture capital market in Australia and New Zealand. And what would happen is companies would list on a stock exchange too early, they wouldn't raise enough money, uh, their share price would fall, they would need to be capitalised, they would be board replaced. It was just, um, there were hundreds of sub-scale uh, growth of tech businesses listed on ASX and NZX. And so we set up a business model to take uh, you know, 15, 19.9% go on the board and either give them capital, give them direction, change governance, help with the strategy, buy something, sell something. Uh, and we, we had some great successes doing that. Um, after the GFC, and I'll come to the great successes in a minute, but after the GFC, we had built a company called travel.com.au, which owned lastminute.com. And we had experienced this e-commerce phenomenon of wanting to grow our business and having five to 10 different vendors selling platform, SEO, pay-per-click, email marketing, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, each taking money out of a bank account, but not talking to each other and not caring about whether... Uh, you know, value was being created for shareholders, whether it actually added up to profitability, um, repeat business for customers, growth, et cetera. And we thought that was a pretty frustrating experience. So we decided in the aftermath of the GSC to aggregate a bunch of digital marketing and platform businesses and form an end-to-end -end, uh, digital transformation company. So we, we literally bought an agency that was really good with Sitecore and Adobe, et cetera. We bought an agency that had multiple performance channels and an email marketing business and some consulting. We put it together in Sydney, in Melbourne. I moved, I sold my house and moved to Singapore to build it in Asia. It was called Asia Pacific Digital. It was ASX listed. Um, I probably put a third of my net worth into it. Uh, and had a very high conviction that we were doing the right thing at the right time to deliver a return for shareholders. Um, in the end, we got it wrong. We were probably three or four years earlier, if we'd hung in, we'd probably be selling it for a fortune uh, right now. Um, but uh, got uh, debt back, we loaned to the company, lost most of our equity, not just mine, but other people's as well, which is a you know, profound source of regret. Um, but gave it a seriously red hot go. And, you know, I mean, I remember when we were selling that company, so we sold. Uh, we have someone saying Roger Sound that's quite muffled. Yeah, thanks for that, Richard. Can you hear me, John? I can hear you fine, but uh, it does uh, sometimes differ in terms of audience audio as well. Okay, well, if it, if it continues, I'll we'll pause and I'll put some earbuds in and see how that goes. Cool. Um, yeah, so 
you know, the end of a five or six year journey uh, came up to shirts on our back and we sold it in a takeover to another listed company in Australia. And I remember being so out of money when we sold it, we had to borrow money from the bidder to get through the bid process. So you, you imagine trying to negotiate with someone, you're trying to maximize value from shareholders, negotiate to borrow money to get through. That was tough. Yeah. Um, so that's an example of one that went pretty badly. Um, but having said that, you know, there was a bunch of good stories as well. Um, what I learned from that one is that, um, you know, be pretty humble. It's pretty, it's quite an affront when you've gone through a career and never had a blemish, never had a mistake, never had a loss. And when you actually have to kind of pick yourself up, shake yourself off and realise you've got it wrong and it's cost you a lot of money, it's cost other people a lot of money, um, it, it's actually mentally quite hard to pick yourself up and go again. And it took me a while to do that, but I did and I have. And, and fortunately, the companies that I now chair have have made billions of dollars for investors, you know, which, which way outweighs something to me felt personally quite, quite difficult at the time. Um, now, just doing a sound check, can you, can you hear this? I'm all good. If anyone's having challenges with it, do uh, do let us know in the chat. But you're sounding uh, loud and clear to me, Roger. Okay. Perfect from so, Stephen. There you go. All right. So pretty early on in the piece when we set up um, uh, Northridge Partners, we bought an internet booking engine, a travel booking engine called Arnold. Um, a, a friend, Adam Johnson from Wellington, and myself uh, bought it. It was post the tech wreck, and it it aggregated travel content, um, hotels. Uh, flights, cars, etc., and then we packaged it up and sold it off to online travel agents, to you know, all sorts of travel agents. Um, it had gone broke. It was struggling. We recapped it. Adam ran it. Uh, we fixed it. Uh, wasn't getting where we wanted it to go, so we vended it into travel.com.au. We actually tried to sell it to Webjet, but they didn't want to buy it. They built their own, so we sold it to travel.com.au, which owned last minute, and you can see this wave of online travel growth around the world. Uh, and you could see that it was going through the States, going through Europe, come to Asia, to Australia, New Zealand. So we injected Arnold because it provided technology for travel.com to run you know, straight through processing. Um, and we built and we built and we built that company. We, we found it at eight cents. We entered a friendly merger with WebJet at I think 34, and then What If came in over the top in a bidding draw and we sold out at 57 cents a share over a, a four year life with about an 85% IRR. That, that's condensing a four year really tough journey into uh, 30 seconds, um, but it's a great model. Um, at the same time, we found um, Soccer of Excellence in New Zealand, which you know, someone else found it, someone else ran. Um, and it had gone through an IPO, had a really good board and good leadership team, but it, it had slightly lost its way. Um, so we bought 19.9% uh, of it. Over time, I went on the board and we worked with board of management to uh, discard, shed the business that wasn't economic for SOE. We then bought the market leader in Australia. I sent one of my, we sent one of my colleagues, Kristen Burns, to Europe to look for businesses to buy. The CEO and CFO moved to the UK where most of the business was based and it just started to perform really, really well. We sold it in a takeover to Henry Schein, which is a NASDAQ listed Fortune 500 company. And uh, it was one of those great processes where they chased it from 90 cents a share to $2.90 a share. And, wow. And uh, there was only one bidder. So I uh, probably shouldn't say that publicly, but it was, uh, it was a really good way to run a process. So we, we, um, we have this model of taking uh, a large minority state and rolling our sleeves up and, and going on the board and really getting stuck in. That model isn't as relevant today because the venture capital market is so deep with so many participants that you don't need to IPO prematurely, but it was very good for about 10 or 15 years. And so we had a, you know, we had a bunch of adventures like that uh, right across Australia, New Zealand. Um, I think you know, we've 
I think we got five or six right, one wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, I have lots of scars on my back, lessons learned from that. When we uh, decided that we would set up a corporate finance business advising tech companies on how to do deals, the thing that really resonated with founders is that we'd actually go in and see them and say, you know, I've been awake wondering how to read payroll at three in the morning many, many times like you. I've lifted and shifted to the cloud. Um, we've, uh, you know, we've wondered, we've worried about churn, we've worried about LTV to CAC, we've, you know, all the metrics, all the things you do, churn, retention, uh, lead gen, cost per lead, conversion, all the stuff that a founder worries about, we understand. And so it's with that lens that we approach how can we help tech companies through either raising new capital or, or selling their business. Yeah, and I know um, you wanted to talk specifically, and I'm very keen to get that overview on, on Geo, um, because I remember Geo as a board member of a competitive company many years ago when uh, Geo was literally just two humans in a garage, and uh, the other company is probably not actually in a, in a that much uh, a very different position to what Geo is now. Um, so, yeah, that sounds like an interesting journey. Not finished yet, but very interesting. Yeah. Um, is that a segue into talking about Geo as a job? Yeah, yeah, perhaps a poor one, but okay, <laughs> that's fine. Well, um, you know, Geo listed prematurely. Actually, my nephew founded Geo, um, and he then left it. And when it listed prematurely, Mark Weldon shared it, and you know, it kind of raced off to the three dollar market. You know, we found it when it had fallen significantly, it was 30 or 40 cents. And I really liked the, the mousetrap and the concept. You could see a big addressable market going for a long time of tradies running their businesses more efficiently. Um, but um, when we found it, I think we significantly underestimated the amount of work to be done. And it's fair to say that the, the path from where we started to where we are today has not been linear. There were a few mistakes along the way. Um, but having said that, um, so if you understand the core business, which is providing a, effectively the operating system for the trading works team to allocate jobs, enable them to quote, invoice, collect cash, and it's it's for um, plumbers and electricians and gardeners and pool cleaners and HVAC, etc. You've got millions and millions of trades uh, using pens, pens and paper. We think every 1% of the total addressable market in ANZ is worth about 5 million Aussie annual you know, in ARR. So if you then add the rest of the world, it's a pretty big market. Um, when we started this journey, the stats were not so good. Churn was probably 24%. It's down to 8 now. LTV, well, LTV is about 2 grand now. It was about $200 when we started. Um, monthly recurring revenue is as low as uh, per license, as low as, as low as two or three dollars. It's ten times that now. Um, so we've slimmed the business, fixed the tech stack. It, it was had significant downtime. It's always up now. Got a great leadership team and it's growing like mad. So we just raised six, or probably be seven in total. And brought some pretty savvy small cap investors and everyone from Aaron Batanaga to Indian Fund Management to some smart Aussie small cap funds. And you know, now that we've kind of dealt with all our issues and have an incredibly transparent, clean, high quality business that just strikes new monthly records relatively frequently, our job is to put our foot to the metal and try and own that market. And, um, you know, we had a share price. I always say don't look at the share price, but everyone looks at the share price. We had a share price that went as low as four cents, I think, during the, the depths of the pandemic last year. We're 17.4 yesterday with a lot of cash in the bank, not a heck of a lot of burn. Uh, the board's good. We've got Rod Snodgrass chairing it. So I chaired it during the turnaround. Rod's a better guy to lead a growth phase. and uh, and. Uh, those, those of you who know Rod, he ran a Spark Labs, excellent guy. Salesh Munger, who runs digital digital transformation to Effector. 
uh, and we're just welcoming Anna White, CEO of Bend, to the board, who's got clearly got some pretty relevant experience having just sold Bend. So a really good little business in the making. Still work to do, um, but at a, quite an exciting time. And you know, on that journey, when there were many, many people who thought we were complete idiots and losers for having a crack at this. And uh, I just kept ponying up and ponying up and ponying up. And I put quite a few millions of dollars into that business because I believe in the space that it's in. And I felt, you know, when no one else wants to invest, that is the time to invest. So I have, and I'm currently the largest shareholder in the business and pretty committed to seeing a good outcome for all shareholders. Yeah, very cool, very cool. And, and look, I'd love to dive into that because there's so many aspects. Um, I think our audience would be interested in and as uh, I know just looking through the list, uh, a number of folks who are either in the process of raising capital or um, have recently raised it. And, you know, with that sort of investment lens and rolling up those things that you talked about um, in the last few minutes, you know, the metrics, the governance, the, um, the, the timing of, you know, the problem that you're solving and how quickly it sort of gets adopted. If you had to, if you had to boil that down in a sort of generic level uh, to a couple of things that really for you sit across all those scenarios in terms of looking out as an investor, what would your thoughts be? Uh, get a world-class CEO. Just whatever you do, put the incentives in place and get a world-class CEO. And got a good, get a good chair as well. You know, a let me just get this right. A great CEO with a hopeless chair can still achieve great things. But a poor CEO with a poor chair is the end. Because ultimately, with a good chair, if a CEO is not the right person, you'll deal with it, you'll put the right person and you'll find a solution. But if your chair is just the wrong person or inexperienced in tech or you know, whatever's, whatever's missing, if it's the wrong chair, you're going to struggle. So I, I actually, you know, a really simple level, if I look at all the things we've been really successful at and all the things we've not been successful at, Let's just assume everyone's done their due diligence, and the market's good, and the product's good. Quality of leadership is everything, and certainly in a public environment, you haven't got a good chair cracking, you know, I always say cracking the whip, but, but leading by example and encouraging and being thoughtful and being onto it, then you have an issue. Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. Um... Great advice, and I guess digging into that as well. And you know, I've been in this position. I think you have also, you know, in a founder position, uh, sort of coming up through the levels of growth. Often, you know, often rapid growth. It's looking in the mirror as to whether you are the right person to lead the next stage, or um, as a secondary, having the realization that your chair, um, as the CEO, founder, and presumably still a major shareholder is not the right one. So two, two pretty challenging conversations, right? Yeah, they are. And, um, you know, I had actually had this um, discussion. I, I, I got a group of um, chairs together of the biggest tech companies in Australia and New Zealand last week in Sydney. We had a private private uh, meeting over lunch talking about talent, talent retention over war for talent, remuneration, all this stuff, because we're all facing the same things. And, and this subject came up about um, how do you tell uh, a CEO, a founder CEO that you know, it's time and you know when is it time? And it's always tricky. Um, I mean, I've always felt that if you explain to someone that a change is probably going to make more money for them on their shareholding, that's quite potent. It takes a while for people's egos to get past that. Yeah. Uh, Person next to me, uh, Alison Deans, who chairs Cochlear, who's a, a super experienced person, made the comment that um, you know sometimes they want to see the mission fulfilled, and if you can put them in a position where someone else is running it, but they can collectively fulfil the mission that they started out with, that's also an additional incentive. Um, you know, if I look at, uh, I mean, let's talk about Geo. Um, you know, I was the restructuring guy that kind of sort sorted things out. It took a while. But Done it and it's been done. Uh, well, it sounds a bit immodest to say really well, but you know, it's, it's been done okay. It's been, it actually has been done okay. We've got a great CEO now. And I just felt 
we want to make money, we want to deliver for our shareholders, and we want super high levels of growth. Someone else is better suited to sharing it than I am. And, and you know, if the difference is a, you know, 5x or 10x outcome, then you sort of put your ego in a little box and you say, who's the best person to do it? And I actually think Rod's a better person to do that than me, so we agreed that we would swap. And I, I think those are the sorts of transparent conversations you need to have. Yeah, I know that makes perfect sense. And I guess, um, you know, kind of the next stage of that uh, around talent is, is just looking at how the landscape's changed and what sort of skills and experience you look for now. I mean, the reason we reimagined Kiwi Landing Pad was because we literally thought we were now in this third territory of, of change. It was significant. I mean, we had Impact Ventures behaving the same way as SaaS companies. We had... Um, a context where multi-stakeholder, which I'll, I'll come back to, we've talked about a lot in our conversations. Um, and a lot of those previous sort of, you know, top three leadership options in those roles have, have possibly changed, would be my view. Do you sort of agree with that? Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, we're no longer just dealing with um, digital adoption. We're dealing with the metaverse. We're dealing with, and we're dealing with, uh, huge ESG and CSR influences as well. So, you know, if, if today's, uh, I think, senior tech or startup professionals not only got to be able to build a business, they've got to be able to fund it, but they've got to understand the nuances out there that are driving the flows of money and corporate behaviour. And it, so going back to what you and I have been chatting about, the ESG, you know, if you're going into one of these roles, you've got to understand that um, your customers demand certain standards on the environment, on sustainability, uh, on gender equality, on pay equality, on everything from modern slavery to you name it. It's a, a very broad church and it's now the price of raising money. So um, it's almost a hygiene factor. If, if you are in any sized company now, you have to have a view on this stuff. Yeah, and you know we've seen that. I've recently had a, a former colleague raise a you know a decent chunk of money, and the the one of the biggest pieces of due diligence was to ensure that that ESG was genuinely uh, incorporated and executed across the business. Yeah, as you and I were chatting about in the, the quick pre chat, John, um, it, I've got a PPC that's a remuneration committee meeting after this, and one of the hot topics of debate as we set our remuneration structure going forward is we have hard cap guys like how much revenue grows, how much EPS grows, what return on capital we get, but then we've got other targets that we're, we're actually actively debating now, do we make carbon neutrality within a short period of time, not through just buying offsets, but you know, through serious change, do we make that a, a KPI that drives people's remuneration? And that's a fundamental change from just a few years ago absolutely absolutely well we look uh, just just coming up on on 30 minutes in about halfway so um there is actually just one question folks if you've got questions we'll um we'll look at those uh, about 10 minutes before we wrap up but israel has to pop off and says will there be somewhere i can watch the rest later on i can actually answer that one absolutely israel it's uh it's all recorded and it will be up on uh, territory three dot community in our um, territory three community uh, academy uh, about uh, 90 minutes after we finish um, so you can watch it whenever you like and tell your friends so um roger just sort of coming back to the you know you've had this lunch with some tech companies and the topic was talent and now we've got this this ESG side of things and you know every uh, person I'm having conversations with we've just been down through Christchurch with Territory 3 held a couple of founder events uh, it is all around talent people are getting uh, just taken out of you know all sizes of companies at huge premiums uh, in terms of offering mainly around cash at the moment but you know, any insights you're able to share, you know, out of that in terms of sort of what we do about this? Because it seems like it's here for some time as a key issue in building a business. Yeah, I mean, it's a terrible problem in, um, well, I was going to call it in Zedistan, but I think not do that on video. It is, it, is, it is a real problem when your borders are closed and you can't trade internationally. I was speaking to a, a very successful 
uh, New Zealand tech company yesterday to the founder who said, I, that's it, I'm really not sure. I just can't operate this way. You know, the war for talent domestically with the borders closed is so bad that, you know, Datacom's hiring of them and I'm hiring of them. And, you know, it's, it's all just people are suffering a lot more money. And if you're working from home at your desk and you can resign from one company uh, by email and accept another offer, 50% more to do the same job from your home. A lot of people are going to do it. So, so we were at this uh, tech chair forum last week, we were talking about it. And it, you know, it's a hot theme because all the companies that I'm involved in, everyone's in the same situation. One quite senior guy said to me yesterday, I've never seen this bad, and I've been in tech for 20 years. So culture uh, is just fundamental people will stay if they like the culture it's not all about money and you know if people are leaving in droves just for money you know the money may be compelling but you know I, i've always felt that uh, i've always felt that culture is sort of number one motivator and retention mechanism but it's hard to build culture when you're all working remotely um and so i, I was talking to um, the CEO of Circo the other day, he was telling me that one of the emerging travel, Darren was saying one of the emerging travel patterns that uh, they are seeing is companies booking um, a series of apartments, workspaces for five to 20 employees for one to two weeks, four times a year. So everyone goes to Queenstown or goes to Whangarei or you know, wherever it is, it's a relaxed vibe, it's different, and you you get together and you work intensively for a period of time and you go back to your, your home environment. That's one way. Um, I know of other groups of people who are actually actively contemplating setting up an office in Queenstown, shifting people there so they can hike, bike, ski, but work in a relaxed environment uh, that they really like. Um, so, you know, people are now having to look for very different things. I know at Iris, uh, We've just brought in um, three day weekends multiple times a year. So you get paid weekends. You have, have three days off on us and recharge. And you know, we're all just having to do new stuff and find, uh, find a way of bringing it together. Other companies uh, around the table said, well, it's easy. We're just going offshore. You know, we are building integrated teams in the Philippines or India that are integrated with our local teams in Australia and New Zealand. So everyone's trying to do it, but everybody's got the same problem. The one comment I'd say is that, that the American companies who think there's a lot of cheap talent down here who pay a lot more in the US are starting to come and hire people who work remotely for them on the US, well, somewhere between Australia and the US wages. So it's, um, it is a problem that no one has an answer to. We're all yeah, and you know, take your point about culture, and just um, wanted to uh, to drill into that a little bit as well in terms of getting to the pithy stuff. I mean, biggest cultural challenge you have faced, and how you uh, learnt from that, and hopefully addressed it. Biggest cultural challenge. Oh, I've had a lot of cultural challenges. I mean, um, when I when I took over running ABNMRO Asia, uh, which was an investment bank, not a tech company, but it was very much a tech investment bank, we had uh, about 1,500 people across the region, and we had been on quite a hiring spree, and then the Asia crisis came, so revenues went down, I don't know, 80 90%. Uh, overhead stayed very high because everyone was paid in US dollars, and, you know, we... The company had recruited a lot of people. So you had two camps of people. You had the original founders who made a whole lot of money selling this company. And you had the, the different pockets that have come from different investment banks. And no one had actually tried to build culture. And you know, if you're in a distributed business across 13 countries, you might all have the same business card, but if you have you know, if your experience is that you wake up in the morning and you speak Farsi or Urdu, you eat mango, some of you eat mango, some of you eat wheat mix, some of you are religious, some of you are non-religious, some of you are binary, some non-binary, whatever it is, we're all different. We need some touchstones 
to draw us together or we're never going to actually achieve anything. So I mean, back in the day, we could fly around. We've got 100 people in a room and uh, there was a Manila, I think, uh, Macau, in Macau. And we, this, we distilled what are the vision, what is the vision of what are the values we want as a team? And we agreed on them. And then we agreed to go and evangelize them through the network. So that wherever you were, no matter who you were speaking to, you recognized the person you were speaking to was different and did get up in, in the morning and eat something different and pray to a different God or whatever you do. But we had certain values in common, you know, five or six things absolutely in common that we were trying to get right. And that's uh, something that I've tried to take with me throughout business. It was phenomenally successful. We turned that business around and it performed very, very well. Um, and you, you see um, a lot of businesses, well, I, I have uh, in the companies we've gone into that just don't have a clear vision of what they're trying to do. They don't have a clear vision on you know, what their values are, what they stand for. And it's a matter of getting people aligned. And if people aren't on the bus, then bring other people onto the bus instead of them. Yeah, 100%. And I guess, you know, um, it's a great example and, you know, reflecting on the values, those are things that you can establish in a startup, right? When there's just two of you in a garage just scheming out this new idea and just um, just figure out what those will be and maintain them as you grow. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's always harder to go into an established company and do it. But I always find it really interesting to ask an established company, what are your values what you stand for? And... Um, you know, I once met a, a senior Frenchman who was chairman of one of the big global advertising companies, and um, and he said to me, Roger, what is your mission statement? And I said, well, what is your elevator pitch? <laughs> and, and, and basically, this guy would buy 20 companies a year and he would reject anything. He would walk around and talk to everybody, he'd reject anything where the people he spoke to could not articulate the elevator pitch. So whether it was the tea lady or the office junior or someone senior, you would ask them, tell me about your business in a sentence. And if they couldn't get it, you just you would say, well, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, totally. I have another riff on that too. I mean, if you don't have an individual mission statement, I think it's quite difficult as a CEO to create one for a business, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. And um, there's been a couple of uh, questions in the chat. And again, folks, um, uh, that's cool, but ideally, if you want to make sure we get them answered, throw them into the Q and A. But a um, couple of things about Geo. One is um, folks in the industry, uh, competitors, uh, or um, other parties in that um, space um, that you admire, apart from Geo, of course. Thanks for the yeah. yeah. Um, well, you have to admire Zero um, just for their. You know, if you look at their uh, smarts and tenacity. Uh, they just go from strength to strength. Um, incredibly you know, purpose-built company, aren't they? They've just gone very hard and they're going to continue to do well. I, I can't speak to them culturally. I don't know, don't know them well enough. Um, but if, if you take it outside of um, the SaaS field, I look at uh, Webjet, which is a company I'm involved in, obviously. But I look at the culture. You know, this is a... This was turning over four and a half billion dollars of travel transactions pre-pandemic. It's it's a big business with a couple of thousand people, and it is the leanest, meanest business you ever find, led by a visionary managing director whose people would crawl over broken glass for him. So we've got that business to big and global, but we've still maintained a lean, mean ethos, and it just comes. I think it comes from the top. I really do. Um, you know, there's no. There are no airs and braces for tenses. There are no, um, there are definitely no frills in that company. It just gets on with business. And, and for 20 years, it's had this proposition of convenience, choice, and customer service. And you just provide your customer with convenience, provide them with choice and great customer service. And that, that's a very simple ethos. So I know that uh, that isn't uh, you know, a, a SaaS business, but it's a tech business and very simple ethos. Yeah, I think it's so relevant. I mean, you know, at the risk of being undiverse, I think if, you, if you've if you got to be careful, don't you, about sort of looking for the number one in your industry, otherwise you run the risk of becoming the tallest dwarf. 
And you know, that's um that's something someone taught me a long time ago is you know, if you're looking for customer service, aspire to be like customer service companies that really smash it out of the park and you know, couture or luxury fashion or something like that, rather than comparing yourselves to the others. But conversation for another day. Um pricing. Thanks, Sydney, for that follow-up on your chat. Um, it's a perennial one. Um, the questions around SaaS, but you know, any any tips that you have on, on either front, I think that's something we all face uh, challenges with. Uh, well, you know, when so in the zero bubble, when zero IPO, well, I was jumping in and making a fortune, then I picked the um, geo op as it then was. Um, so there's a swear joke here. You know, use the word op, put money in the swear jar. So where do you go? Um, in the early days, it was all about selling. Um, it was very clear to us that the you know, the, they were reporting uh, large license growth, but not talking about the economics. So people would literally go to trade shows in skimpy clothes and give out licenses to tradies either free or a dollar or two dollars a month. And you know, market price today twenty two. Um, and so when we found this thing, it had a lot of licenses and it had growth, but it had no value being added to shareholders, and LTV was incredibly low. So we actually just upgraded the price and were prepared to share a whole bunch of licenses. And we figured that you know, if over time we get the lifetime value up and the marketing metrics up, you'd have a thing of value. But if your LTV is 200 and your cost per lead is 250, it's never going to be an economic business. Now our cost per lead is 65. We're converting really high percentages and our, our, our LTV is about two grand, over two grand. Um, so, you know, it's really tempting to give it away to get momentum, and that may be appropriate for you in the early days, and it may have been appropriate for Geo then. Uh, but I think for any business, you know, there's a point at which you have to connect all your metrics and say, what does a lead really cost me? How quickly can I convert it? What's our retention rate? Um, and, and what's the value um, of the customer? So, um, you know, so the specific challenges that we faced were all about a, an uneconomic business in a great market. And it took a while to sort that out. But we have now. Very cool. Got a question here from Siobhan. G'day, Siobhan. Uh, many founders, CEOs, and other execs attribute part of their success to having a mentor to help guide them through challenges, lift them up, et cetera. Uh, it's pretty common in the US, but not here. Did you have one? Um, how important do you think they are and how common is it among your peers uh, in being a mentor? Yeah, uh, well, that's a really good question. And, you know, the, the, the challenge with being a chair is you're supposed to be the mentor. And there's actually no one to mentor the chairs. So I, I've had a range of people over time, depending on the job I was doing, have actually, you know, I probably didn't realise it time I was getting mentored. Um, you know, you go through a phase of your life when you're, you're all about growth and building things and people try and help you and sometimes you have to, sometimes you don't. Um, I probably wasn't that great at listening when I was younger. But today, uh, when I'm supposed to be the mentor, um, one of the reasons I got this group of tech chairs together uh, last week was it took a year to get these people together with some pretty interesting companies. There is nowhere for chair chairs, chairmen, chairwomen to go and you know, get the therapy. And we all sat there comparing notes on what it's like retaining staff, um, motivating them, attracting them, running board meetings by Zoom. So, you know, really practical things like we're on a Zoom platform, someone wants to do a presentation. So you've got 10 little directors, two inches by two inches, or you know, centimeter by centimeter. You can't read your body language, they're single dimensional, they're tiny. Um, how do you know how your CEO is feeling about the direction of discussions going in? Um, how do you deal with being on Zoom? You know, you're in your 50s, you know, so your energy levels are a bit lower than they were in the 30s. I'm not talking about myself, of course. And it's midnight, and you're on a bigger, you're on an intergalactic Zoom call for the management. How do you deal with that? So, you know, it may sound like I'm going a bit off-piste, but actually um, 
I think the top dogs need an ability to talk about stuff between themselves to make sure they're on the right track. I, I sat down with a, a really senior chair yesterday to compare notes and, you know, I learned quite a lot from it. It was really useful. So I think, um, you know, you can get yourself mentored in a number of ways, but no one ever asks who chair, who mentors the boss. Yeah, 100%. I think it's increasingly crucial because of so, so many of these new things, right? You know, we always talk about uh, uh, the playbook and a lot of CEOs and chairs don't actually have one for this uh, for this last couple of years. It's, uh, it's thrown in a few curveballs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Richard Chui, go Chui. Great session so far. Thanks for sharing your experience. How did Northridge Partners come about uh, with Peter as MD and building the team as a tech investment bank across Asia Pacific? Be great if you can share the growth journey from the beginning to now and the future. Thanks, Joey. Oh, that's um, <laughs> it was interesting when I left AB Number Bank. I was running global technology. Um, now that's global tech clients and assets and investments, not code. I couldn't write a line of code. This is a this is a declaration. Um, when I left that gig and moved the family to Australia. I wanted them to be closer to their family. I was actually locked out of all markets. The bank was in for three years. And so I couldn't do a lot of the things I'd be doing. And I got dispensation from the bank to put my own money into publicly traded tech companies, go on the board and help improve their performance. Um, so when we found Software of Excellence and Travel.com, I got clearance from the bank to do it. Uh, managed to convince a, a colleague, Peter Hine, to join me. Um, and uh, we started investing in tech small caps um, and uh, it, it worked. We actually got direct capital uh, out of Auckland to invest with us. So I put up about half the money and they put up the rest. And we invested together in some of these and suddenly we realized we had a bit of a franchise bill. Then I chaired my first public tech company and then another one and another one. And, Suddenly, over time, I migrated to big caps. Um, at a point, we had done about 100 transactions for our own portfolio, you know, convertible notes, placements, Series A, B, C, buybacks, debt, M&A, acquisitions, disposal. We've done so many things for our own portfolio that companies started coming to us and saying, oh, that was really good. Could you do one of those for us? And we said no for ages. And then about four years ago, uh, we decided that actually this is probably a good idea because there's so much money going into the tech sector and there aren't that many specialist advisors who actually, as I said earlier on, who actually get this stuff, who you can have a discussion about products, about cloud, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we set up, a, um, we set up an investment banking business when I was uh, in Singapore, living in Singapore, building Asia Pacific Digital. Um, we've got about 15 professionals now across the region. So it's a small business, but definitely punching above our weight. And, and suddenly, four years later, you know, we're just about to sell one of the big Asian telcos data centers for about 500 million. We're doing a, quite a large agri-tech deal between China and the Middle East. We've just raised a Series B for Fleet, one of Australia's space companies. We'll be doing more for them. Uh, we're doing quite a large media transaction. I think we're about to do an EV battery deal that could be, could be in the billions. Um, so I think the, the fact that we just do tech related deals and don't do stuff we don't understand, like biotech, like resources, like property, like food, just do tech, combined with the fact that, you know, I'm really open to people who who want to deal with us, you know, we've made enough mistakes that we, you know, we feel quite humble. Um, and would you rather have someone alongside you who's done good things and, and got things wrong or somebody with a superficial knowledge and that, you know, I always call it ice skating, people skating along the surface uh, is what we aspire not to be. So hopefully that's a, a bit of a, a, a background on the firm. Yeah, cool. Ice skating. I remember that one. Um, a couple more questions. Uh, to Trang, uh, thanks for your question. Um, he's thanked us for putting us together. Uh, as a bootstrap technology founder, how does one navigate? Oh, God, we could spend 
we could spend a whole session on this one, building products for SMBs in terms of pricing and building presence given current times. Um, he's also hustling for uh, whether you're open to advising and mentoring upcoming startups. Got to love, got to love the hustle. <laughs> love the hustle. Um, uh, I, um, my dance card is so full, I daren't take anything else on it because the polite answer. Um, oh, look, I don't even know where to start to answer that. I, yeah. You know, uh, the truth is, um, you know, I did my first startup in 1982. I now work on much larger businesses, similar problems, but but not in the startup space, a little bit beyond startup. Um, find a good mentor like, so you, you asked me the right question, and someone like Rod Snodgrass, I, I just watched him with he's fantastic, he's mentoring uh, young companies, and you know, he's got this exponential thinking gig happening, which is the way to go, he's a very non-linear person. Um, you know, someone like Snotty or Claudia Bat and some of these big thinkers who are generous with their time, will spend time with you, may spend time with you. Um, you just got to find the right one. And yeah. it, it does take a bit of navigation. I would think John are probably a better source of who to go to than, than I am. Uh, yeah, nice, nice bet back, mate. Um, yeah, we we uh, we do do that. Territory three. Um, you can just fire us a, a note um, to myself or Lilia, uh, and we have a, a monthly newsletter, and we'll put in it whatever founders are looking for, and see whether there's folks in our six thousand odd community that they might be able to help. Or to your point, Roger, are, are a good fit. Um, anonymous attendee. We always have anonymous attendee on the call at some stage. Um, see you listed geo quite early. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Well, what's the minimum size you advise a company to list in the NZX? And I, and I see also there's the new catalyst um, that Collins just, just started for SMBs as well, so a secondary market thing. And what would you consider before doing that? Well, we, uh, we picked up the pieces when Geo fell out of bed, so someone else listed it. And it was definitely subscale. It's still subscale. So post the current uh, capital raise, it'll have an enterprise value probably We'll have a market cap of about 32 or so, an enterprise value maybe in the mid-20s, um, still at the bottom end of acceptable. It's certainly found that we're really at the bottom end of acceptable when its market cap is five or six million dollars. Uh, it's fortunately recovered since then. I look, I think um, you know, 50 is your absolute starting point. I, I just wouldn't. I, Geo was an ill-conceived IPO. It shouldn't have happened. And you know, we've picked up the pieces and are starting to get it right. It's not quite there yet, but it's, it's close. Um, it's really hard if you've got a market cap of less than $100 million. No one will write a quick research on you. You're too small and illiquid to attract investors. And you can't really um, guarantee liquidity. So I've always felt that when we've gone into these small caps, you'll find that we've sold them in a takeover to generate liquidity for everybody. Uh, you can't rely on the market as an exit if you're going to build a big position. So, you know, companies that are small like this, it's really a case of caveat. Go with your eyes open, knowing they are a lobster pot. They look appealing, you get in there and you may not be able to get out. Yeah. Yeah, great, great advice. Uh, look, we've got about uh, just over five minutes to run. The time's gone fast. It's been great, Roger. Thank you. Um, so, team, uh, community territory three, if you've got any other burning questions, now's the time um, before we wrap up. But I'm a little surprised we haven't had one of the regular ones around investment on, uh, on valuation. So I'm going to ask it. I mean, you know, there's frothy times, arguably, a lot of capital around. Um, and then, you know, I think from a founder's perspective, a lot of headlines saying, Company X has just raised at valuation Y, and you look at it in terms of where they're at and their stages, and you think, gosh, that's a that's a fantastic outcome based on the traditional sort of financial model. What what are your thoughts currently if you're sitting there as a founder, either looking to raise for the first time with some traction, um, or and also just you know follow on investment, right? Is it a good time to be to be looking at that, and how do you how do you look at valuation from that point of view? Well, I think you've got to focus on what you can control, not what you can't control. What you can't control is the potential for rampant inflation and interest rates to go up. We can't control the fact that currencies are being debased and crypto is, is going, excuse the pun, gaining currency, but you 
get the sequences to be based. You know, we can't control all that stuff. All we can do is look at, is there a, a large addressable market that is sustainable and high growth? Is this company going to grow faster than the value will go down if we get it wrong? So in other words, if this is the sort of the bell should be ringing because it's near the top, and we, you know, it's a, a, a risky time to commit capital, may or may not be. Um, does the growth, the quality of management and the growth potential more than outweigh that. And uh, I would argue that uh, absolutely, if you've got hope in a big addressable market, high growth, COVID environment, everyone's digitizing, um, you know, put your foot down and do it. And, you know, don't make the mistake that Kiwis often make and it's raised too little. So you, you interviewed uh, John, Wickstrom recently from Magic Memories. Yep. Wick, when Wick got in trouble and he rang, well, when Magic Memories got in trouble, as everyone did, COVID was in trouble, he ran up and said, can you help? Can you refinance us? So we we jumped in, dropped everything and helped and sorted out. And you know, the one comment I have that he's, he said, I think, on, on Territory 3 is, you know, don't just raise a little bit because you don't want to be diluted. Don't raise enough that you can, you know, that old story, that old expression, the tide goes out, you better have swimming trucks on. Yeah. Uh, when the tide goes out, you got to have enough bloody money in the bank to get through. So don't nickel and dial and raise a million of this five million in the market. Yeah, totally. I think that's probably never been more true in the current environment, right, in terms of unforeseen delays or, uh, or risks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, one more here from uh, from Anonymous. What, what's the standard valuation you usually see for the first capital raise of something that's got no revenue or close to no revenue to raise the first million bucks? So we've got two of the two of the metrics. Um, what's the second one? I'm going to flick that back to you, mate, because <laughs> we, only, we only do Series B, C and onwards or public company raises, and I, I'm notoriously bad at picking how the price a very early stage start. I mean, I know when I did my first, on um, how long have we got three minutes? I have to flex slightly here, but this is a good story. In 1982, when I set up Data Corp, I had no idea how to value things. I had a venture, I found a venture capital company, got the MBR to write an article about the firm. Uh, the journal came in and the phones were ringing off the hook because we had a group of students making them ring off the hook. Um, they thought it was a great proposition. The NBR reported on it. We got a venture capital fund in and they paid, you know, a big multiple of revenues and profitability we thought we were going to make three years out. I have this thing called all three percent. You make a third of the money you say you're going to make, it takes three times as long and three times as much money. So I reckon that first round is highly um, um, it's a highly perfect science, but as an investor, I'm always skeptical about hockey sticks and how long it takes. And, you know, when we raised our first few million bucks for data Corp, it was totally a wet finger in the air, all sentiment. Well, the thing is you only get one opportunity at the start to just simply adjust your revenue forecast by changing an Excel spreadsheet, right? So um, I think the, the challenge, the, the, the way that I always address this question from my perspective is simply that, you know, the headline way, way out and your three analogy is a great one. What does it look like as a founder in terms of how much of the company you own and how much is it worth and how many rounds of investment is that going to take? So when you're looking at your first round, you know, those are really the sort of parameters you're looking at. Um, and to your point, raising enough money to, to get into that, you know, massive addressable market and to, to get some traction around that solution. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we under we underestimate um, good investors' recognition that you know those are the things that will actually make it a, a much better investment if you are fair and reasonable, obviously assuming that you've convinced. And you know, we have a lot of pitch resources. Uh, Nick Crocker from Blackbird Ventures just recently did three live critiques of pitches uh, probably three or four webinars ago. So if you wanted to have a look at that um, from a founder point of view, it's very useful in terms of how investors think. But to me, that's the one. It's just... Um, where do you want to be at the end of this journey? Um, how, within reason, do you start that with the headline in mind and um, and make sure that you know you're going to end up in the place you want it to be at the end, knowing to your point, Roger, that 
it's going to be multiple rounds, multiple dilution. And also at the start, you're going to need you know, enough money to actually make a difference to get to that next stage, um, rather than just sort of trying to shape yourself into, into a valuation. So if you get those two numbers right, the valuation just pops out the end, doesn't it? I'm not a mathematician. But... Yeah, well, it's all um, educated guesswork to start with, isn't it? I mean, I, I just look at the look at the numbers and then look at the founder and say, well, if it's a big addressable market, I really believe in this person, it's worth a lash. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that trumps everything uh, in the early stages, really, uh, for those who have done it a few times. And it's Roger. Just, just a few progs, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Mate, it's been fantastic to, to talk to you. Really appreciate your time. Um, and folks out there in Territory 3, um, I'm sure you've got something out of this. I certainly have. Um, look forward to seeing you again on our next webinar. Uh, and, yeah, thanks for watching. And, and again, Roger Sharp, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. See you. See you later. Thanks. Bye.